As dedicated pioneers of groundbreaking research, Durham University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences are working together to push the limits of scientific exploration. We are committed to international collaboration, creating scientific solutions to understand our world and beyond. The Chinese Academy of Sciences, China's driving force in exploring natural sciences and harnessing technology. Durham University, a globally outstanding center of teaching and research, inspiring our people to make a world-changing difference. We share common ground. Both centers of world-changing research and innovative teaching, both with a commitment to interdisciplinary research, producing practical solutions to real-world problems. Energy to astronomy. Surface science to climate change. Together, we are stronger and will achieve so much more. We will stimulate fresh ideas, open up new perspectives across intellectual and geographical boundaries, and create a better understanding of the big scientific questions. We will inspire you to explore how science can improve the world and change our lives. We invite you to join us. Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, everyone. My name's Stuart Corbridge, and I'm honored to be the Vice Chancellor and Warden of Durham University. And it's my very great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you all to Knowledge Across Borders, a new webinar series brought to you by Durham University in partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to join us from around the world to hear a joint lecture from our two very distinguished academics, Professor Renbin Zhan and Professor David Harper. This webinar series forms one part of Durham's long-standing friendship and partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and we are delighted to be able to work together in this way. Our academics have collaborated on hundreds of research papers over recent years, and this deep partnership means we're able to work together to address some of the most pressing issues in society today. Both of our organizations are conducting world-changing research by pushing and exploring boundaries and by developing science-led innovations which can benefit society. I'm naturally very proud of our community at Durham University, where we have highly talented individuals carrying out boundary breaking research and finding practical solutions to real world problems. Our scientists are currently working on a wide range of issues, including decarbonizing heat, climate change, resilience to natural disasters, super water resistant surfaces, non-cuttable materials, new ways of killing tuberculosis, the use of dogs to detect COVID-19, microplastic recycling, and of course, biodiversification and extinctions. And it is thanks to our community of researchers across our faculties that we are recognized as one of the world's leading universities in the QS World University Rankings. So it feels very fitting to have a joint webinar series today with the Chinese Academy of Sciences as we share again and break common ground. Both of our organizations are committed to interdisciplinary research which can improve the world and transform lives for the better. Thank you again for joining us. It's my pleasure now to hand over to Professor Yaping Zhang, Vice President of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, to greet you all and to make some preliminary remarks. Thank you. Respect the Vice Chancellor Stowe Corbett, Pro Vice Chancellor Knell Omani, respect Professor David. Harper and Professor Zhenbin Zhang, dear colleagues and friends. 
It's my great pleasure to attend this Knowledge Across Border webinar jointly heard by the Doran University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. CS is the largest national scientific research organization in China, composing of more than 100 institutes. CS is also a large institution of higher education con consisting of three universities, UK's USTC and Shanghai Tech. CS attach great importance to international cooperation and we have long-term partners with Doran in a wide range of research fields, including panel biology, astronomy, biosciences, and so on. 2020 is the uh, unusual year full of challenge. The outbreak of COVID-19 worldwide greatly changed and will still have strong impact on scientific development and international exchanges. Yet, the pandemic can never stop us. On one hand, CS scientists have made a serious important outcomes on the R&D to fight against the virus. On the other hand, we have modified our communication mode and further optimized our international program such as PiFi. I believe Doran has, made, has done the similar things and this knowledge cross board webinar series is an excellent illustration of our collaboration in the post-COVID-19 era. Taking this opportunity, I would like to extend my gratitude to Doran leadership team, to our two speakers and to the organizers of the webinar. I would also like to thank all the audience who are with us today. I hope you enjoyed the webinar witnessing the sharing of knowledge without border. And we welcome you to exchange and uh, collaboration with all researchers by various means, including our international program. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Vice President Yaping Zhang, for your very kind remarks and for being with us this morning. They're very much appreciated. Many thanks, Vice Chancellor and uh, Vice President. Um, before we can commence this joint webinar, uh, Ren Bin and I both have a few words of introduction to say. Um, I've been collaborating with colleagues in Nanjing for nearly 40 years. Um, I first met academician Professor Rong Jai Yu at a conference in Oslo um, in 1982. Um, and uh, we published our first joint paper in 1988. I was invited to China uh, for the first time in 1992. It was a very unique experience for me. Um, we had field work in remote parts of northern Guizhou province, outstanding geology, warm and hospitable people. Uh, Ren Bin was Professor Rong's PhD student at the time and was already a, a rising star. Um, we wrote up uh, much of our results on a very long uh, train journey from Guiyang to Shanghai. Um, I think the journey time is now much shorter. I've, I've visited Nanjing many times over the years and Ren Bin and I have collaborated on some 30 papers, uh, many substantial. And Ren Bin is already a illustrious career with many publications himself, awards and honors. He is currently the director of the Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology, uh, the largest group of invertebrate paleontologists and paleobotanists in the world. He's also president of the Paleontological Society of China and he's chair of the Asian Paleontological Association. As a further bond, Professor Rong, Ren Bin and I, um, we're all linked by the Chinese birth sign of the snake, as all good brachypod workers are. Uh, Ren Bin is a close friend and a great collaborator, so I'm going to ask Ren Bin to say a few words before we start our, uh, our uh, webinar. Okay, hello everyone. Good, good afternoon and uh, good morning. It's my great honor 
to give a talk at uh, today's webinar that represents a new stage of the collaboration between NICPAS and Durham University and between the CAS and Durham University. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Vice President Zhang Yaping, to Vice Chancellor Corbridge, and particularly to all those people who organized this webinar. As Dave said, I'm a research staff currently at the Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Collaborating with Professor David Harper and his group for more than 30 years with many joint papers and monographs. We are now not only colleagues, but also very good friends. To be honest, I have learned, man, learned a lot from Professor David Harper during the past decades because as an internationally well-known geologist and paleobiologist. Professor David Harper has many strong points. He has a very wide scope of knowledge, not only geology, but also many other subjects. He is full of initiative ideas, particularly in the investigation of those major biotic events during the geological history. He is academically very active and is always willing to make contribution to our scientific community internationally. He was the former president or chairman of the International Paleontological Association. And he is now the current chairman of the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Dave also has a very strong professional dedication. He has overcome a lot of incredible, incredible difficulties um, um, during the past decades doing fieldwork together with us in at least 10 provinces within China, including Xizang, Tibet, and Xinjiang. He had a bad hypo, hy, hypoxia reaction in mountain over 5,000 meters uh, high in Xizang, but he insisted finishing um, sample collecting there. From our collaborations during the past decades, particularly uh, those case studies we conducted in South China, we have made important contributions to our understanding on those major biotic events in Ordovician and Cerulean periods. And now our collaborations still going on. So we are all optimistic about our future for um, about our collaborations. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Ren Bin, for that. And I think we'll get we'll get started with the webinar now. Um, and um, what, what we're going to do is split it into two. So I'm going to talk a bit about the, the context and um, uh, some of the causes and consequences of some of these major biotic events uh, that occurred in the early Paleozoic. And Ren Bin is going to follow up um, with talking about some of the really exciting new data and ideas that are coming out of China um, that are really changing our thinking on, on some of these uh, biotic changes. Um, this opening slide, I think, sums it up. It's a, a wonderful graphic by uh, Nicole Barnes, um, a student at Imperial College, and it really shows the, the actual transition um, between um, an Ediacara biota here, um, which um, is dominated by large um, distinctive soft-bodied organisms. Um, and as we cross the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, we come into the Paleozoic with a lot more familiar creatures. And these are animal-dominated ecosystems. And, and so our challenge is to try and understand this transition and this diversification of animal life um, on our planet. 
I've put this slide in for a bit of context. Um, and the first point I'd mention is that the planet is about 4.6 billion years old. And then we come into some of the oldest sedimentary rocks uh, in the Isuo complex in West Greenland, for example, where Monique Rosing and others have identified the biologically light carbon isotope, um, indicating that life was around 3.8 billion years ago. Um, we go through a whole um, phase of most of the Precambrian, which is dominated by microbial organisms. Um, these guys here are stromatolites, they're very familiar to geologists, um, and they're um, laminated carbonate rocks associated with cyanobacteria. So life was small throughout this very long interval of geological time. Um, there was uh, increasing complexity um, where we begin to get some of the first eukaryote organisms about 2 billion years ago, and the diversity and complexity builds up as we go up through the, the column. Um, towards the end of the Precambrian, we get these marvelous organisms, the Ediacara biota, which um, signify that life has become large and a bit more complex. And then bang, we're into the early Paleozoic with much more uh, familiar sorts of animals, such as the brachiopods. And so our challenge really as geologists is to sort of understand this transition um, from early earth, a pretty miserable place. Where presumably, um, we had the appearance of one prokaryote cell, one organism, um, that throughout the Precambrian life was small, and this is Shark Bay in Western Australia, where we have living stromatolites, um, uh, into the tremendous diversity of the planet that we have today of, of 20 million plus eukaryote organisms. And so that is our challenge to look at this. Um, our challenge today really is to talk about a more limited but uh, extremely important interval from the late Precambrian into the Cambrian um, and uh, where we're seeing this transition from the Ediacara biota um, into uh, more animal dominated uh, <coughs> ecosystems of the Paleozoic and subsequently. Um, and so our evidence is based on body fossils going out in the field and collecting. Uh, data from embryos, and there's very good data in South China, trace fossils, the uh, behavioral patterns of organisms, biomarker data is becoming more important, and of course the molecular clock where we can track um, the roots of, of some of the major groups of organisms. Um, and so over this key transition, we're, we're seeing changes from simple to complex organisms, minute to large organisms. We're seeing animal-based communities arriving on the planet, and we're seeing the diversification ramping up during the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event here. And then subsequently, and not on this diagram, um, this first burst of biodiversity is halted by the end Ordovician extinction event. Um, there's a big taxonomic dimension to this. Um, this is all based on the description of fossil organisms, um, which is extremely important through monographic works. And we wouldn't have these data without these descriptions. Um, here again, we've got geological time coming up the side, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian. Here we've got a diversity curve, and this is the big jump and the Cambrian explosion here. Um, things um, fall off a little bit. There's a big gap in the Ferongian here at the end of the Cambrian, and then it takes off during the Great Ordovician biodiversification event, and then it's halted by our first of five major extinction events. So the areas we're gonna concentrate on, the Cambrian explosion, the Great Ordovician biodiversification event, and the end Ordovician extinction. And one of the key uh, topics at the moment, are these changes gradual? If we filled in all the gaps and we had a perfect fossil record, would this just be a gradual curve as Darwin and others um, would, would have suggested? Um, or is the, the biodiversification punctuated by a number of discrete events? We'll come back to that a little bit later. There is a phylogenetic dimension to this um, in that um, there was a major explosion of body plans 
here at the base of the Cambrian and then into the middle Cambrian, which we call the Cambrian explosion. Um, and this is um, epitomized really in Stephen Jay Gould's uh, marvelous book on the Burgess Shale, one of the key localities for the Cambrian explosion based on the old uh, Frank Capra film where a small town financier, um, uh, his whole life uh, was governed by chance and contingency if he only knew that. Um, and this is the same for the fossil record in Stephen Jay Gould's mind, that evolutionary processes are all about chance and contingency. There's no given trackway to evolutionary processes uh, through geological time. And there's a very strong ecological dimension to the whole story. And not only are numbers of taxa and body plans diversifying, but we're also seeing ecological changes from biotas that are more or less fixed to the seabed, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, um, with a lot of mats, microbial mats, and very little activity in the sediment. Um, into the Cambrian explosion, where we have all sorts of wonderful um, animals with limbs, digestive systems, mouths, antennae, they can run around on the sediment, they can burrow into the sediment, they can take off and swim through the, the, the water column. And so a tremendous diversity of more familiar sorts of organisms, although many of them are a little bit weird looking to ourselves. And then during the Ordovician biodiversification, this great uh, jump in species, genera, and familial uh, diversity, and then organism taking off into the water column in the Silurian Devonian, particularly the big predators, perhaps the seabed was becoming a bit too crowded. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a number of these faunas, um, five actually, very briefly, the Ediacara biota, which I've mentioned before, and this marks the, the end of the Precambrian, it's dominated by soft-bodied organisms, and they generally lack different organs, tissue types, they're mainly uh, fixed. However, there is increasing evidence that there are more and more animals involved in this community. Now, they may have been hidden, it may be a little bit like the mammals during the Mesozoic, they were very much in the shadows uh, until the dinosaurs became extinct. And this may well be true of some of these uh, communities within the Ediacare. But certainly the roots of the animal tree um, of life were already part of the marine ecosystem at this time. And I rather like this slide, the Savannah hypothesis of Graham Budd and Søren Jensen, um, where the fixed organisms are gathered around um, um, nutrients. Uh, obviously the nutrients uh, get used up and these organisms probably don't have anywhere to go. And this has encouraged the mobility of organisms, rather like uh, early hominids on the savannas that are moving around looking for food sources. So organisms did have to start moving around. Secondly, just at the base of the Cambrian, we're beginning to see what's known as the small shelly fauna. So organisms are developing sclerites, shells, skeletons, those sorts of things. Possibly it happened by accident first as a excretion, um, and then they were found to be quite useful uh, um, for uh, protection against predators, desiccation, um, attaching organs to those sorts of things. But um, in uh, South Australia, South China, many other places in the world, this is a really important event. And all sorts of weird and wonderful shells are appearing. Um, a lot of this material is probably um, the armor plating of worms, but there are some individual organisms, such as early brachiopods, for exa example, um, that are whole organisms uh, using, using these skeletons. And then thirdly, the Cambrian explosion, which I've mentioned, and uh, diversity really gets moving here. Body plans appear on the scene. And I'll talk a little bit about field work in North Greenland where um, I led a couple of expeditions in uh, 2009, 2011 um, to go up to the Sirius Pass, uh, which is this area here and look at Cambrian rocks um, overlying the, um, the white limestones of the Port Fiel formation um, in the Buin formation here. It's a wonderful place to do field work. Uh, it's only accessible by helicopter or twin otter. Um, and the pilots always ask you to repair the airstrip before they return. Um, otherwise they may not return. 
Um, sampling bed by bed, so just taking an exposure apart and collecting everything. And here uh, we identified a lot of material in the field and built up a rarefaction curve. And basically here we have the number of specimens at the base um, and the number of species up the side. Um, and as we go up here, um, the curve should flatten off and that would indicate um, that really uh, any more sampling is probably not going to reveal any more species. But we're up to um, over 45 species. I, I know there are many more being described by other groups. And, and so the story is not yet finished. There are some um, truly remarkable fossils. Here's a, a large Arthroaspis that we collected in the field showing the digestive system and impressions of the ribs, uh, of, of, the, um, of the limbs uh, and all these various bits and pieces. So remarkable, exceptional preservation um, in this particular fauna. And, and these are a couple of plates that we uh, published recently um, showing the, the, the diversity of, of animals that we're, we're pulling out of these sediments and the remarkable um, present uh, preservation. So, Trilobites, um, very few species, but one or two are extremely common. Arthraspis, which I mentioned before. Um, and over here, we have a, a fragment of a, a frontal appendage of a large anomalocarid. And these things were thought to be vicious predators. Many of them probably were, but some of them, and I'll come back to this later, were probably sweep net feeders collecting uh, material in, in, the, um, in these hair-like nets in the front of the animal. For Tulicolians, um, a remarkable and, and rather enigmatic um, uh, animal. And here, Kerygmatkila uh, and the front end of it with some of the, uh, the, the brain tissues and the optic nerve actually preserved on the animal. So there are some remarkable finds there. And this has allowed us to actually make models of some of these rather unique um, animals. Um, this is um, Espen Horn and uh, Copenhagen's models of Halkiri, a slug-like animal with two shells. Uh, here's the Kerygmakila swimming around in the sediment and on the uh, forum um, and, and um, probably a predator, similarly uh, Pamdelurian here. And so these key elements can now be physically modeled so we know what they look like and we know what they probably did. And finally, well, North Greenland seabed, what was it like? We've done a lot of geochemistry on this um, with Emma Hammerlund in, in Lund University. And we can track through the geological profile here, the diversity and the abundance of various groups of animals, but we can also look at the geochemistry here. And taking this together, it would suggest that we're probably on the edge of the oxygen minimum zone um, for the actual environments that we're talking about. There were uh, incursions of oxygen now and again, uh, but nevertheless, um, pr pretty low oxygen conditions. And this also aids the, the preservation, the exceptional preservation of, of these organisms. And if we were to summarize uh, very briefly, um, the Sirius Passat fauna, not a big fauna. It's very remote, it's very difficult to get material out and we can't spend that long actually collecting. The summers are very short in North Greenland, but dominated by mobile animals. Many predators were there in a highly populated water column. And the seabed was associated with microbial mats and sponges, but burrows, those sorts of things. The microbial mats, a bit of a hangover from the, um, the late Precambrian, a sort of transitional time uh, for, for, um, for organisms. Um, and um, obviously uh, a lot of these uh, organisms diversifying and evolving at the lower boundary of the oxygen uh, minimum zone. This is our giant anomalocarid. And rather than having grasping frontal appendages, it probably trapped food here in, um, through these um, uh, hair-like uh, structures. So very different from the classical uh, interpretation of the anomalocarids. Um, I mentioned the exceptional pres uh, uh, preservation and we, we call these Lagerstetten uh, and there are a lot of them around in the, uh, in the Cambrian. 
the, there's a whole group of them here. And there's fewer and fewer as we go up through the fossil record. So we have to remember that um, there are some exceptional conditions that were not always repeated later in geological time. And if we were to go to a classic um, uh, Cambrian locality in North Wales, well, the weather probably wouldn't be very good and it might be quite difficult to collect fossils. You would collect some brachiopods, some early mollusks, um, some trilobites, some sponges, those sorts of things. That would be a classical Cambrian fauna. But once you get exceptional preservation, look at it, incredible diversity of body plans. And this is the basis of what people call the Cambrian explosion. Well, why did it happen? Well, there was what was known as the, 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 the great unconformity at the base of the Cambrian. Across many continents, we see um, folded and uplifted Precambrian rocks. That, um, and, and here's the, these rocks here vertically. When the, the Cambrian transgression came in, bringing the sea over the, um, the landscape, it deposited these Cambrian rocks uh, horizontal uh, relative to these, but more importantly, the erosion of, of these hinterlands brought in a, a, a whole set of nutrients into the basin that organisms could use. Um, Paul Smith and I put together um, a model, and as Einstein um, said, um, models are almost certainly wrong, but they're very useful, and I think we'd apply the same to our model here. Uh, but here is the, uh, the, the uplifted hinterland being flooded by the, the Cambrian transgression, erosion of all these various materials into the sea, the various um, elements uh, here being used by organisms to, um, to build their, um, their shells and skeletons. We have the origin of biomineralization here. As the sea level rose, there was more habitable area for all these organisms. They started burrowing, the uh, substrate became oxygenated, um, and, and we have this explosion in biodiversity, uh, a, a more, much more complicated food web and the origin of um, organisms living in the water column. Um, the fourth fauna I want to mention is the great Ordovician biodiversification fauna. Um, and this is a huge um, jump in uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, here's the classical curve of the, uh, the numbers of uh, fossil genera throughout geological time. Um, and this has been corrected for sample and collection size but we still have this huge hike um, throughout the Ordovician um, of numbers of species, of genera, of families. And there's a gap of about 25 million years between the Cambrian explosion and the Great Ordovician biodiversification event. People have used various models, the court jester model, the happy little guy that um, runs around keeping the king happy. If he doesn't, um, he gets his head chopped off and they find another one. Um, so this is all about big, exciting events, um, environmental, climate change, those sorts of things that may have um, uh, facilitated, enabled the biodiversifications. Um, we also have uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Red Queen over here. Um, uh, and she keeps running to stand still. And on a much lower level at community levels, the relationships between organisms, predator prey relationships, they're both evolving relative to each other, they're moving forward, um, uh, but um, the relationship is essentially standing still. So this is another uh, means to create uh, biodiversity. And finally, global cooling may have been uh, a major factor in this. Uh, common explanations, they've been around for quite a while. Um, the late Cambrian anoxia, which essentially stopped biodiversification, arcs, islands, etc. cetera, um, evidence of uh, uh, areas of the Earth's crust that may have been like the Galapagos today, that they were uh, biological um, hotspots, species pumps, a mid division cooling event. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, asteroid impact hypothesis, stirring up the, uh, the seabeds and creating ecological disruption. And finally, a Red Queen one, Ordovician food chain revolution and predation, the interaction of these various organisms with each other. Um, so um, a number of years ago with research students from uh, 
Copenhagen, uh, we did a number of um, expeditions to parts of Western Russia uh, with, with colleagues from uh, St. Petersburg. And we collected again, bed by bed, um, 30,000 brachiopods through this particular interval of geological time in the middle Ordovician. We can see the biodiversity curve here, peaking here in the middle part of the Darawillian. Um, but it's coincident um, with um, oxygen isotope uh, excursion of the light uh, oxygen isotope, which uh, indicates uh, substantial global cooling. And so this cooling uh, has been associated with this burst of biodiversification in the middle part of the Ordovician. Here you see some of the brachiopods, which are extremely well preserved uh, from these sections. Um, how do we put it together? Um, well, it's not just because organisms like it cold, uh, they probably don't always, um, but um, the, the cooling started up uh, an oceanic gyre, the cold water um, spilling off the ice sheets uh, um, here at um, high latitudes and setting up this conveyor belt, which started to bring up um, a lot of um, nutrients, uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, sort of um, geochemical substances, etc., onto the margins of many of the continents, encouraging this biodiversification. And why did that happen? Uh, why was there a global cooling? Uh, well, one idea is this massive meteorite shower that happened about 466 million years ago from an earlier breakup in the, the meteorite belt, the asteroid belt. And, and this, the dust around the planet may have encouraged uh, this particular ice age. Um, I, well, the, the Middle Ordovician and the, the Gobi, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event is everywhere on the planet, we can see tracks of it within the brachiopods and within the benthos. And some of the work that Ren Bin alluded to, we did a number of years ago together in visiting, um, visiting Tibet. And um, right at the top of Everest, we know that there are Ordovician rocks. Um, we know there are brachiopods and conodonts and crinoids. Um, now, we didn't get up there ourselves, obviously, uh, but as Ren Bin mentioned, uh, we did actually collect uh, from rocks about 5,000 meters in altitude, um, absolutely superb sections of Ordovician rocks um, near Gian Kun, next to the, the Friendship Highway. Um, uh, very rich brachiopod faunas, absolutely fantastic scenery, and um, actually quite hard to work in the field because of the low oxygen conditions. However, once these fossils are cleaned up and investigated in a bit more detail, we found that they were part of what people call the Tablehead province. It's an equatorial um, province during the Ordovician. And um, looking at the components of this fauna and comparing it with other faunas throughout the world, uh, we recognize uh, that they're very close um, to um, the Apophophyla group, uh, to other uh, Tablehead faunas. Um, all the way over to Western Newfoundland, for example. And, and using principal component analysis and cluster analysis, uh, we could recognize uh, the Apophophyla group, the Takima Tablehead group, but also a rather interesting fauna that seems to be uh, particularly restricted to South China, which was uh, much, much different. And I know Ren Bin will talk to this a little, um, talk about this a little bit later. Some of the key evidence has just been published yesterday uh, in Geological Magazine, this paper here, um, which are from a fossil um, group called the Conodonts, which give us very precise ages um, for uh, the top of Everest. Um, so what happened? Well, we think the plankton appeared first, um, and certainly the, um, the Proterozoic Oceans were pretty mucky. There was a lot of cyanobacteria, other sorts of green scum. Once the eukaryotes came on the scene uh, in the early Paleozoic, they, they, they were like a hoover. They cleaned up the oceans here, uh, and we had clear water. And we see the phytoplankton um, increasing in numbers, the zooplankton, um, and we can compare it against a later rise in the benthos 
uh, many of these organisms that we're uh, actually feeding on the, on the plankton. And we can summarize this in this rather nice diagram. Here are some of the key characters, the acrotarchs here, the chitinozoans, also a lot of larval organisms here. Uh, and we can track um, some of the plankton here starting way back in the Cambrian and coming into the Ordovician and then pushing this Ordovician biodiversification of marine invertebrates. And so if we were to draw back a little bit and, and, and look at this as a whole, um, here is the uh, entire um, uh, Ordovician here, the, the late Cambrian um, tacked in here, um, and we see the plankton diversifying first then the benthos, and then we get our reef building organisms towards the end of the Ordovician. And this, uh, many people would call this the great Ordovician biodiversification event, where we see the increase in standing diversity of, uh, of genera, uh, rather like this. And this has all ended rather abruptly by the two phases of the end Ordovician extinction event. And, and if we look at it again here, here's our Cambrian explosion. Here's the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event. Um, the only thing it seems to uh, relate to very well is an increase in sea level um, seems to be an important factor. Uh, and here we see the drop here at the end of the Ordovician. And very briefly, I'm going to just um, summarize the end Ordovician extinction event, and then I'll uh, hand over to, to Ren Bin. There have been many um, causes put forward. Um, the, I think the, the one that's gained most traction uh, is the ice sheet expansion, um, uh, the cooler waters that we find uh, across the globe. Um, obviously, this has consequences uh, because we find that the, uh, the sea level is actually dropping as the, uh, as the water is taken up in the ice uh, sheets, uh, a drop of maybe 100, 150 meters, and that really reduces the amount of habitable um, space there were for organism. Here a compilation of some graphs um, showing essentially the drop in, sea, uh, in, in temperature uh, from a number of studies um, at the end of the Ordovician. Um, another area that we, we have looked at is there were a lot of collisions of continents at this particular time. And so the numbers of terrains were very much uh, reduced again, reducing the amount of uh, habitable areas at the time. And then finally, the role of anoxia, and we mentioned this in the late Cambrian, uh, and certainly um, the, uh, in terms of the deeper water faunas um, in the, the Catian, the foliamina fauna, for example, um, then that suffered very greatly. And then the second phase during uh, the transgression as the ice sheets actually melted, brought a lot of this uh, eucinic water back onto the shelves and um, were, I think, featured very heavily in the, um, in the second major extinction. The cause of the causes, well, people are now talking about a, a lot of very good evidence from mercury um, that there were volcanic eruptions at this particular time. And so it wasn't an asteroid cloud this time, it was perhaps um, a volcano um, that was kicking off and um, causing the, the Ice Age. Um, We've done some rather nice network analysis. Um, I mentioned Huang Bing here, who's one of the younger generation um, of, of people in, in Nanjing that I collaborate with now. Uh, and, and these are all the localities uh, that we can find uh, brachypod faunas in the early part of the Henanshan. These are the guys here, the Henansha fauna. Uh, and they're quite different from um, the Cathy Edgewood fauna. We used to think they were the same age but now we're very clear um, that this uh, Edgewood fauna is in fact younger than the classical Hanansha fauna. And um, we can now look um, in some detail, uh, and this is a huge database um, put together over the last 15 years by myself and my colleagues in Nanjing, uh, principally uh, Professor Rong, um, showing the distribution of this Hanansha fauna, this guy here, which was very widespread. Uh, probably the most widespread cosmopolitan fauna of all the, the Phanerozoic. And subsequently, we have the Cathay Edgewood fauna. And this is the sort of um, cartoon, really, of what's been happening. Uh, and I know that the Chinese data has um, uh, 
has been right at the forefront of our understanding of these transitions from um, the, the faunas uh, in the, uh, prior to the Hanantian, prior to the um, Ice Age, the foliamina fauna, um, tiny, thin shell brachiopods living in deeper water to the very widespread Hanantia brachiopod fauna, and then taken over by the Cathy Edgewood fauna, which is dominated um, a lot more by um, athyrids, atropids, rhynchonellids, pentamerids, those sorts of things. So we see um, some really uh, remarkable faunal turnovers, biotic changes during this particular extinction event. And this has allowed us um, to really get to grips with what happens during an extinction. Um, here we have the, um, the, um, the extinction events here, which took place in two phases, one at the base of the Hanantian, one in the middle part of the Hanantian. Um, the, the faunas before in the Catian, um, very distinctive on, the, um, on our various continents and in the deep water, the foliamina fauna. These were all wiped out essentially as the Hanantia fauna and all its various associations and ecosystems took over um, the middle part of the Hanantian. And this disappeared and again was taken over uh, by the Edgewood Cathay fauna. So a whole series of replacements and faunal turnovers um, during this, uh, the first of the big five extinction events. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Ren Bin, um, who's going to talk um, about many of the, uh, the, the new data, the new ideas um, that are actually changing the way we think about these three um, great events based on uh, the, the wonderful material from China. So thank you. OK, back again. So after <clears throat> Dave's uh, general introduction, now I'm going to give you some more information about these three major biotic events uh, based on the uh, case studies we conducted in South China. Now, uh, South China Paleoplate is one of the major tectonic uh, plates uh, of China. Um, it formed a complete paleoplate about 800 million years ago. Since then, um, it kept a unique paleogeographical setting. I mean, uh, from old land to platform to slope and basin. So such unique uh, paleogeographical setting uh, kept for several hundred million years. Under this uh, paleogeographical setting, um, many complete geological sections developed with um, pretty complete geological records. That means the continuous sedimentological rocks with uh, a lot of uh, abundant different kind of fossil assemblages preserved. About 630 million years ago, we found the earliest known multicellular algae fauna in southern Anhui province, eastern China from the Lantian Formation. And slightly younger, about 600 million years ago, we got the oldest known sponge. That's the, uh, one of the oldest known animal fossils from the Wenghan Formation. And again, still the Wenghan Formation, we have found tons of animal embryos, the fossil animal embryos. It's about 590 million years old. Younger to 550 million years ago, we got the um, only discovery of the Edicarum fauna we find in China. So um, from the middle part of the Jin formation here. And there are many different kinds of um, animal fossils. And very important um, is 
here we find the body fossil preserved together with the trace uh, made by uh, this particular animal. They preserved together. Now, altogether, this fauna, um, it's about 21 genera uh, covering almost all those uh, major groups of fossils um, we found in Australia for the Ediacara fauna. Younger to the um, end of Precambrian, that means the top part of the Dengying formation, we got the uh, we got a very abundant and a diverse small shelly fauna at many localities in South China. Now these are the um, small shelly fossils, many kinds, over two hundred genera, uh, about more than twenty. Uh, different kinds of fossil groups, such as brachiopods, arthropods, mollusks, and many other uh, problematic uh, groups. Up to the early Cambrian, about 520 million years ago, we find a unique um, fauna called Chenjiang fauna from the well laminated mudstone and shells, the Chunzo Su formation. This particular fauna was characterized by very well preserved, um, exceptionally well preserved, soft bodied um, animals, various kinds, such as lobopodians, brachiopod, um, priapulida as Stenophora, uh, Vatilicolia, and even the earliest known vertebrate fossils we found. Yeah. So just because of this exceptionally well-preserved fossils of different kinds, they're actually almost all known animals nowadays. So already got to, um, the stem groups already preserved there. And most of them uh, actually without hard parts, only soft-bodied and well-preserved. So the Chenjiang fauna was elected by the UNESCO um, into the World Heritage List in 2012. Now some more examples of the Chenjiang fauna. You can see most of the fossils we found are just soft body without hard parts. Polyphera, Cnidarian, and uh, uh, many kinds of Lopopodia. Yeah. So uh, still mm, quite a few um, problematic forms nowadays are still being studied. You see different kinds of Eurasopoda uh, representatives. So very well preserved soft parts, soft parts of the animal. Now, this, the earliest known, this kind of arthropod, um, soft part together with the hard parts pre preserved together. Uh, this is the uh, star fossil of the Chenjiang fauna, very famous. Yeah, this one, the anomal carrier, sarin. So it's pretty big. Yeah. So altogether, the Chenjiang biota. So we have 21 phyla, about 260 genera, and close to 300 species, as well as 27 problematic taxa are still being studied. So beside the taxonomic study, we also conduct the, the paleoecological study using sedimentological and uh, geochemical methods. So we found the Cambrian explosion is actually not only a taxonomical diversification, but also an ecological complication. So to sum up, using the evidences we found from South China, uh, the Cambrian explosion actually could be further subdivided into several stages. Now before the Cambrian, the pre-Cambrian, late pre-Cambrian time, it's 
or repre uh, it's, uh, represents a, pre a prologue of the Cambrian explosion, uh, represented by this uh, different, where uh, or exceptionally preserved biotas. And the small shelly fauna represents its first episode. And mainly, uh, most importantly, the Chenjiang fauna represents the main curtain of the Cambrian explosion. So put them together, the Cambrian explosion in, China, in South China uh, uh, happened dur during more than 100 million years. It's a long period. Now, um, after now we, we finish the Cambrian explosion, from this diagram we find the diversity curve actually after the Cambrian explosion uh, are still becoming uh, more and more, even um, more, uh, becoming more, more rapidly, uh, going up more rapidly. That is the Ordovician radiation. So using another way of looking at this diagram, we can find the great Ordovician biodiscretion event actually um, occurred during the most um, part of the Ordovician period, but mainly in the early and middle Ordovician. And this particular event um, constitute the basic framework of the Paleozoic evolution fauna. To explain the main characters of the Gobi, uh, we make a comparison with the Cambrian explosion from these four aspects. Just now, Dave already mentioned the great Ordovician biodiversity event mainly manifested on those uh, lower uh, levels of um, taxa, uh, mainly orders, fam families, and in general. And also after the Gobi, the Earth's marine ecosystem now first become very complicated. Uh, the tearing uh, the, for the first time became very complex uh, because before Ordovician, uh, the Cambrian evolution fauna mainly in those shallow water benthic regions. But after the Gobi, the Earth's eco, uh, marine ecosystem become very, very complicated. Using another metaphor um, to explain uh, the scientific significance of Gobi, um, we, the, we all know the tree of life on Earth. If we say the Cameron explosion constitute the, the main trunk of the tree of life on Earth, we can say the Gobi for the first time make this big tree be full of branches and leaves for the first time. Now, we, um, after more than 20 years case study in South China, we found um, in South China, there are several advantages for us to make um, the investigation on Gobi because the unique paleogeographical setting. Under this unique Paleogeographical setting, we have many complete Ordovician sections, continuous sections with uh, continuous lithologic rocks. And most importantly, many or an, and abundant uh, marine fossils, particularly brachiopods, trilobite, graptolite, are uh, preserved together at one section and even at the same horizon. So make us uh, enable us to correlate all these um, different sections precisely. And within China and even um, in a, a much larger region and even in the world, a precise correlation. We made um, 
several case studies in great detail. And here I cite six of them. And these are uh, some of the members of a working group. Uh, in the field, we measured and collect the section and the samples layer by layer and found thousands, thousands of fossils um, preserved in these layers. Taking uh, one of these uh, localities as example, let's say this locality in Guizhou province, southern China, we collected in great detail. Uh, first of all, um, based on the graptolites, we um, further subdivide this section into several different graptolytic biosomes. So before our case study, our international colleagues, they recognize the diversity change against different stages or even different series. Now we can recognize the diversity change against different biosomes. Each stage normally uh, concludes three to four graptolytic, uh, graptolytic biosomes. So after finish this work, we put them together, all the uh, material, all the results of six sections, uh, put them together with, uh, against um, different biosomes. Now we found the Orovision diversification or the Orovision radiation in China actually uh, started at the beginning of the Orovision and it got its first ACME um, near the um, end of early Orovision, this particular time interval, which was much earlier than the global trend. So why this occurred, this, uh, the South China, uh, the Gobi occurred much earlier. We got some implications from this modern diagram. This diagram shows there's a cold time here in Eastern uh, Equatorial Pacific. That means uh, around the Galapagos Islands. So this particular area, just because the cold current, uh, so uh, cause this particular area is a global biodiversity hotspot. So we propose the cold time might exist way uh, before in Orvision time. And source China paleo plate or source China plan as a typical peri Gondwana terrain. Um, um, or long already, I mean, early or, uh, and uh, the entire Orvision time already and in the way of this cold time. So just uh, affected by the cold time and to the end Orvision time exactly affected by this cold time. So um, that's why the Gobi occurred in South China much earlier than anywhere in the world. So after we got to know the alpha diversity change, we also made some synecological analysis for the brachiopods in South China. We are using uh, some numerical methods like uh, cluster analysis and principal component analysis against different graptolytic biosomes. So put them together, different biosomes, we found um, the, there's an apparent stasis between the beta diversity change than the alpha diversity change. And just now we mentioned the uh, Orvision radiation, the first ACME occurred at this particular time interval. And it was manifested by the origin and flourishing of this particular uh, brachiopod community called a cyanosis community and in the normal marine benthic region. And then it's it enlarge its ecological scope, both to much uh, nearer shore shallow water benthic region and uh, more offshore deep water benthic regions. So um, this diagram shows um, the uh, hypothesis initiated by David Yabrowski 
1983. And he, he mentioned the both, uh, all these three evolution faunas uh, evolved uh, at um, near shore shallow water benthic regions and then move uh, offshore direction um, in, while enlarging their ecological scope. So the um, case study we conducted in South China um, tells us the, another side of the story. So um, sum up for, the, for our understanding um, about the Kobe uh, from the case study uh, we conducted in South China and move to the end of vision mass extinction. Now, obviously, the, this one um, is the first among the big five uh, during the Phenozoic. And according to the taxonomical laws, and it's also the second largest uh, mass extinction occurred during the Phenozoic. But recently, some of our colleagues found the ecological damage during the end of mass extinction actually very weak, much weaker than the other big four. So some of our colleagues are challenging the concept of AOMI. They even ask the end of vision mass extinction, it was a mass extinction or not. So we, we should ask what was real essence of AOMI. Now, this time, uh, once again, the case study we conducted in South China, and of course, all the works uh, we did in South China together with Dave and his group during the past decades. So once again, so um, the case study we conducted in South China um, help us to know, to understand the essence of AOMI particularly. So just like um, Dave says, South China is always holding the keys to some important enigmatic geological problems. Just because South China, it has uh, a unique paleogeographical setting and gradually uh, moving northward to Northern Hemisphere. Under such a unique paleogeographical setting, we have many continuous or vision serving boundary sections developed in South China, continuous sections. Just for, uh, at this site, for this section, um, shorter than 10 meters. So we collect more than three tons of samples, mainly uh, paleontological samples, as well as some sedimentological and geochemical samples. After um, detailed studies those on those um, fossils, particularly graptolites and uh, trilobites and brachiopods, we got a very precise biostratigraphical subdivision for this section. So we made um, more than 40 uh, sections this in a uh, very detailed study um, in South China. So put them together, we find the end of vision mass extinction exactly existed and also manifested by two episodes. Now, very clear. Now, the, so this shows the different graptolytic biozones. So we recognize the biodiversity change in great detail against different graptolytic biozones. And the Cryptolytic, the, the, the biodiversity change we already found um, um, is true that there was extinction and also uh, with two episodes, but we still don't know how the animals uh, went through this particular time interval. So we made another case study in South China. Um, in the border region of Zhejiang and the Jiangxi provinces in this particular small area to check 
the stratigraphical and paleo paleontological responses to the paleogeographical erosion. At the age of 448 million years ago, the paleogeographical setting in our research area, we have a very narrow platform as a very short slope and a typical inland basin. So under this particular geographical setting, we have shallow water uh, shelly fauna and also deep water shelly fauna preserved um, um, constantaneously. Um, the Artisuela is a typical rinconalid brachiopods first recognized in the Alte Mountains, Russia. So it, uh, together with uh, some other uh, companies, it represents typical shallow water uh, benthic um, communities. So these are the, um, the, the uh, some of the brachiopods of this particular brachiopod fauna. You just pay attention to the sizes and uh, diversity. Size is normally three to five uh, centimeters big, uh, wide or uh, long. The Fulumena fauna is just now Dave already mentioned is typical deep water. So the concept of the Fulumena fauna was initiated by Professor David Harper more than 40 years ago. It represents an association of minute thin shield brachiopod uh, association uh, representing deep water environments. It has uh, some core elements. You can see the typical Fulimena fauna we found in our research area. So you, you just pay attention to these small sizes. Yeah, normally around three millimeters long or wide. So one million years younger, we, the, the paleogeographical setting changed. The slope and the inland basin disappear in our research area. And we only got the Artisurella fauna, the shallow water um, benthic faunas. And this fauna is quite different with the uh, Artisurella fauna we just mentioned. It's much, much bigger and much less diverse. One more million year younger to the early to middle Hernanian, even uh, changed again the, the paleogeographical setting. Now this side, the old lands uh, emerged and uh, we almost, we, we still have very thick rock sequence, but we almost couldn't find any fossils in our research area. But at this particular time, in the vast area of the, uh, of the Yangtze platform, we got another fauna called Hernantia fauna, just now uh, Dave already mentioned. Hernantia fauna, the first recognized in <clears throat> Hernant, UK. So it's represent um, a shallow water, cool, water, um, benthic faunas um, occurred, developed, particularly during the late or end or vision uh, time. It uh, constitutes lots of tens of brachiopods together with other shelly fossils such as trilobites, um, um, bryzons, uh, and corals and some others. Case study for tens of years in South China, we found the Hernantia fauna in South China is actually most diversified and it has its widest distribution and the longest geological range and also have the strongest ecological differentiation for this particular um, black fauna. It could, in South China, it could be further subdivided into different communities and sub-communities. One million year younger to the end of vision time, you can see the paleogeographical setting changed again slightly. And here on the vast area, 
of the so Yangtze platform, we only have crypto lily deposits, the black shells um, formed. The, that means the bottom part of the Loma Chi formation. And here, only one locality we found uh, near, just near Hangzhou, we found very unique, very tiny shelly uh, fauna we got. This is the only one, um, Shelly fauna, I mean, the ant Orvision Shelly fauna we find in the world. So this one, now make a cross uh, section um, in South China from upper Yangtze platform to lower and to our research area. We can find one million year older, we've, we, we have um, very abundant developed Hernandia fauna and then the Hernandia fauna disappeared or extinct. Then in this area, particular deep water benthic regions, we got this very unique um, brackable assemblages. So we propose this particular area might um, act as a refuge during the end of vision mass extinction. So one million year younger to the earliest uh, Saruian time, um, even uh, changed the paleogeographical setting, we have another um, Brackabolt uh, Shelly fauna developed called Cathesiosis fauna. Here, uh, on the vast area of the Yangtze platform, other parts of South China, we still have the uh, graptolytic shells, but only in our research area, we have this particular um, fossil. Um, Shelly fauna we found. Now, this is the um, continuous section, the continuous or vision Surian boundary section in our research area. We found near the bottom of the Surian, we got this uh, Brackwell fossils uh, fauna. And this work was published a few years ago together with David Harper in UK as a monograph. Some examples um, of this particular fauna, you can see very huge um, shear sizes. It's uh, normally uh, around five, uh, three to five centimeters big. So um, to sum up uh, this story, we can find with the changing of the paleogeographical setting, we have different um, different geological records, uh, such as the lithological units and a biotic turnover. We can just now already explain. Another uh, interesting phenomena I would like to point out that there are the, for about 11 million years, we only have um, about 50 meters rocks, but for 2.1 million years, we have more than 2,000 2, meters thick rocks. And here, 2 million years, only about 600 meters thick rocks. So the sedimentation rate changed substantially, yeah, more than 200 times as much as the former one. So should be something was happening during this particular time interval. So back to this uh, diagram, they're talking about the end or vision mass extinction we can find was actually manifested by the turnover or replacement of different brachypod uh, faunas. Now, such phenomena we also um, found for the, for the trilobite and graptolites. So they all manifested by the replacement of different faunas during this particular time interval. That means during the end Orvision or the transmission to, of the Orvision Saruian transmission, the ecosystem never, um, never collapsed. Yeah. 
So talking about the causes of AOMA, just now Dave already mentioned, I just uh, pointed out one thing. So we, already, we all know nowadays our um, Earth, our uh, globe, so we have two ice caps on both um, poles, but the total sum of, the, of both ice caps the, is 24.5 million cubic kilometers. The Orvision glaciation, we have only one ice cap in then southern pole, but the ice cap very huge is more than six times as much as the our current one. So such a huge ice cap causes a um, um, dramatic um, drop for the uh, of the temperature and also the um, drop of the sea level. Our most recent case study we conducted in South China of confirms this huge ice cap occurred within less than 100,000 years. So very rapid. Yeah, that's why this um, glaciation caused the end or vision mass extinction. So to sum up um, for our both um, presentation, we have at least five um, conclusions. The first, the Cameron explosion makes the uh, main trunk of tree of life. The Gobi uh, caused a massive increase uh, of, uh, of diversity of the ecosystem. And the um, and or vision mass extinction uh, together with apparent environmental changes, but not catastrophic. South China has continuous geological records, uh, including uh, lithological units and uh, many um, different biology um, fossil legislations representing the, these major uh, biotic events. Um, the radiation events like the Cambrian explosion and Gobi normally lasted much longer than the extinction events. And the extinction events normally with rapid uh, environmental uh, changes. We, when we're talking about triggering factors of those major biotic events, we, uh, we have to think about the global factors as well as the regional factors. And sometimes the regional factors even took uh, much more important, uh, the regional factors is sometimes even more important. The last, right, the marine life after the end of vision mass extinction was moderately stable for um, more than 200 million, uh, 50 million years till the end of Permian. So that's, that's all for our presentations. Thank you. I think we're going to be moving to a Q&A now. And I think we have a uh, facilitator, Stuart Jones. Um, I'm just looking through um, some, some of the things. And there, there was a, um, an initial question uh, came in uh, before about how long is the Gobi? And um, that's a really timely and topical question. Um, uh, it's very much up for debate at the moment. Um, and so I, I can start the answer by saying, um, according to some people, Barry Webby's original definition, um, it included the entire Ordovician. Uh, and so 40, um, 45 million years. Um, clearly that's not an event <laughs> in, 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 um, in anybody's terms, um, but we have used that for very many years. Um, I think the second point I'd make is that uh, many colleagues now are focusing on a middle order vision event, and that's really good for brachiopods and, and other elements of the benthos, and that's really good um, for, for um, scientists working in North America, in the Baltic, in Avalonia, because certainly there was a very major event then. But as Ren Vin has pointed out, um, 
it happened much earlier in South China. There's a very big event in the early part of the Ordovician in South China. Um, and so I think um, we have probably have to move away from uh, using the term event for the, for the, for the Gobi um, and, and, and perhaps um, understand that the diversification probably started in the late Cambrian uh, uh, and continued through the plankton into the benthos um, then onto the reef building organisms during the Ordovician, but there were a whole series of events um, across different groups, different groups diversified at different times, um, and also the diversifications took place in different environments and on different paleoplates at different times. I don't know if, if Ren Bin wants to come in and say a bit more about, um, about that. <laughs> I, uh, I think you've already explained enough. Uh, I got another question here asking, do we have any fossil meteorite localities in China? And um, that's now, yes, we have. Actually, just now Dave cited the papers about the meteorite, the papers dealing with three sections, uh, two from Sweden and one in China, uh, in Yitang area is also within South China. So we do, have some evidences for, for the meteorite. The problem is um, we still don't know exactly or accurately um, how to connect the meteorite um, with the diversity explosion. I mean, the diversity uh, diversification. So how to uh, exactly um, to connect both events so they're still, still studying this. We don't know exactly. Dave? Yeah, okay, thank you. So, what, um, so have, we've got other questions. Perhaps Dave, uh, the one by Joe Boating. On to both of you, this would be, uh, how far do you think is it possible uh, to extrapolate the Ordovician diversity patterns seen in brachiopods to the diversification of other invertebrate groups? Okay, well, um, thank you, Joe, for that. And um, as, as many of you know, Joe's a formidable um, worker on, on fossil sponges. Um, and um, I think my, my point there would be, yes, of course, we do have a lot of biodiversity curves for different groups. Um, the, the, the Graptolite people have some wonderful data. Trilob trilobite people um, ha have some really good curves. And I think, and um, I think from your sponge data, you're developing curves yourselves and, and, and finding um, patterns there. Uh, uh, and uh, my comment would be that um, we shouldn't expect all these curves to be identical, because I think my experience and other people's experience, Ren Bin's experience, is that um, the, these, um, these patterns are actually uh, diachronous. They occur at different times in different places. Uh, and really, when we're looking at a global curve, we're building up. It's the sum total of a lot of regional biodiversifications in, in terms of the geography of the world, but also regional in terms of the different fossil groups. Um, I don't know if you want to, do you want to add to that, Renvin? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, actually, just because of the time limitation just now, I didn't mention. So, uh, so Actually, Dave already mentioned, we um, published a paper together in Messiah in the year 2006. We're talking about one of the basic characters of Gobi is Diachronos. The Diachronos uh, existed um, almost um, yeah, within different major groups of one phylum and uh, existed uh, in different major fossil groups. Let's say in South China, just now I mentioned the brachiopod got its first diversity acme in the late early Ordovician time. Um, but for the, uh, for the trilobites, the first diversity acme in South China actually came near the early uh, or the end of middle Ordovician or early late or vision time, much, much later. It's uh, uh, quite different. And graptolite is also different substantially. Graptolite 
mainly uh, um, manifested, I mean, the COVID manifested in the slope phases and not um, major changes occurred on the platform phases. So they're all different. The diachronus um, it's existed uh, everywhere and also uh, different from um, terrain to terrain, plate to terrain, a uh, plate. Yeah, existed. Okay, thank you. Um, a question by Robert Field here, uh, which is a little bit more general, but if life is mainly on the continental shelf, is it any surprise that there are extinctions if the sea level drops? So with less space, wouldn't there be more competition and therefore only survival of the fittest? So perhaps you, you might like to try to address that. Dave? Um, Dave? I'm, quite, I'm quite happy to start with that. That's absolutely sensible. Yeah. And, and it's a very good point, a very good question. Um, and actually we, we have agonized about this. Um, the late Pat Brenchley, who did a lot of um, uh, preliminary um, and um, well, that, well, actually, uh, insightful work in the um, in the 1980s um, uh, pointed out that if you drain the shelves, then the actual benthic zones are going to get bunched up. They're going to get closer and closer together. And as you say, Robert, there'll be um, uh, competition be between these, or because there's really not much space left. Uh, and so it's an entirely um, uh, sort of sensible model. And, and it's a model that we, we still use today. Um, I think um, going back in time, people like Jim Valentine, again, put forward this idea many, many years ago as a, as a general point, um, that if you reduce habitable area, then yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You're gonna get competition because you've got reduced space. So, yeah. Ben, yeah. Anything? Yeah, I, I got a few, uh, uh, a few more. I want to say, see, for the for the end of vision mass extinction, the yes, the the sea level drop um, cause the platform fishes, the those animals living on the platform, they lost their um, benthic regimes, but actually um, the Glaciation happened several times during the Friendsoic, but they never caused mm. um, mass extinction, particularly internationally, or not a globally mass extinction, except the end or vision one. So the end or vision uh, glaciation actually is, is, is too quick. It's uh, just now I mentioned, um, it occurred um, shorter than 10, uh, than 100,000 years. So it's too fast. The sea level drop is too fast. Those um, sh sh fossils living on the platform, they even couldn't move downwards to those um, um, environment, environments. Uh, they just got extinct. That's the explanation uh, currently we have um, for the end provision mass extinction. Okay, we have a good question here from Annalisa Ferrati. And how much of the story could be ruled simply by preservation? Perhaps Renbin, would you like to go first there? Uh, which one? Well, how much of the story could be uh, simply ruled by preservation? So how does preservation play its role here? Um, how much? Well, uh, it, it, this question is very good. Yeah, uh, when we do field work, um, we always pay attention to the preservation um, of the fossils. Um, after we made case studies at so many sections in a vast area, now we, we, we always take off those um, bias caused by the preservation. So. We generally speaking, to, in a vast area, now we found the general trend. So we already um, take into account the preservation. So it affects, if we just study one section, it may be just a um, pre pre preservation biased. Um, but uh, for several or many sections, so then 
this kind we say um, um, to some extent it's uh, our um, conclusions is reliable. Yeah, Dave, I, would you like to add some more? I'd, I'd probably add that that it is yeah. a it it, it is a. Um, a challenge um, that Darwin identified in his Origin of Species in his two chapters on, on geology. Um, Thomas Huxley pointed out that the fossil record was just the skimmings of the pot of life. Um, what, what I always think is that we're setting up hypotheses and our data um, is essentially framing uh, hypotheses that we're testing with more and more data. And I would say to Annalise that um, the, the, the patterns that we see, and she'll know this from her conodonts, um, that um, the patterns that we see, um, okay, the amplitude may change, um, but the, the basic positions of the biodiversifications um, and the extinctions are fairly stable now and have been for, for very many years. So I think the basic pattern is, is probably okay, but there will be changes in the, in the sort of amplification of the pattern. And I think we see that um, in terms of we know where the Cambrian explosion is, um, but it tends to be governed by the exceptional um, fossils. So the diversity and body plans and in higher taxa is always increasing. The amplitude is always increasing, but the sort of general position probably isn't. And I think it's the, the same for a lot of these radiation and extinction events throughout geological time. That's great. A question from uh, Kun Yang, who apparently is in Beijing railway station on the way to Nanjing at the moment, um, <laughs> wanted to know, while the animals experienced great radiations and extinction events during the Cambrian and Ordovician periods, how were the primary producers doing? So perhaps you, Dave, would you like to start? Well, I can probably answer Chun's uh, question. I think I, 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 it, is, it is really important to look at the primary producers because um, uh, they are the things that actually are driving the biodiversification. And I think we, um, certainly with the Acritarch record, um, which we can extend right back into the Precambrian, um, we, we have a pretty good handle on the diversity of Acritarchs from the, well, uh, later uh, Precambrian, Proterozoic, through the Cambrian uh, and into the Ordovician. Thomas Cervais and others have, have done some fantastic work on this. Um, I, 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 so I would say that diversity is is um, is is um, pretty good. We we know a lot about that. The problem with the phyto and the zooplankton is abundance, and we'd really like to know how abundant the the plankton actually was. Um, but that's a very difficult area to get involved with to make estimates on actual abundance of, of these microorganisms. Okay, brilliant. Um, Stella Felsinger asks a question here, which uh, is, which Lagerstatten do you think could still hold the most discoveries to be made? Well, thank you, Stella. I think that's one for Renbin. <laughs> Renbin, yeah. Uh, which, could, could, you, could you repeat the, the question? Which so Lagerstatten? Which Lagerstatten yeah. do you think holds the most discoveries to be made? How is the most discovery be made? Mm. Well, um, we're just talking about the the state in Cambrian age. Mm. So probably the 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 the, the Lagerstatt and the Xinjiang uh, fauna, I think is the is the most outstanding one. Do I understand? Um, I mean. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think if we look yeah. at the rarefaction curves for um, yeah. a lot of the Lagerstedt, and I think Chen Zhang is still holding a lot of promise for, for, for more species and genera, and, um, and, and also the huge amount of effort that goes into collecting by the various groups in Chen Zhang, I think oh, yeah. Yeah. a lot yeah. more prospect yeah. for, for new material. Yes, and in our days we have, we have found many more, a lot more um, new uh, localities for the Xinjiang fauna or biota, just not only in Yunnan province, but also in other provinces in southern China. Uh, and actually, um, as long as you find the rocks of that similar age, you will find the Xinjiang biota. 
um, with exceptionally well-preserved uh, fossils. So like the Qingjiang, Qingjiang fauna uh, already published last year in Science uh, by our colleagues. So that, that's in Hubei province. So that's uh, very similar to the Qingjiang fauna and about the same age. So, so quite promising this fauna, still a lot to be found. But I guess, I guess we shouldn't uh, forget that there's a lot of great work being done in Burgess as well. There's new localities turning up there. And um, there's a lot of material has been collected from North Greenland, but hasn't been worked on. But I would suspect the North Greenland um, diversity is going to be a little bit lower than, than some of the others. Not, I think Chen Zhang is way over 200 species. You, you probably can tell me the exact number. Well, more than, more than 300 species already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also very abundant. Yeah. Both abundance, richness, and diversity, both, mm -hmm. both are very high. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have, we have a related question here from Richard Field who asks, given that most diversification hotspots in today's world are not in preserving environments, how biased is our view of past biodiversity patterns and diversification? So Dave, would you like to go first there? Yeah, well, I think that's an extremely good point. And obviously the, the, um, the species pumps, the biological um, hotspots we have today are can be associated with volcanic terrains around the world and um, the, the uh, microcontinents and, and, and these sorts of areas. Um, and, and so we can only hope that um, uh, a lot of the work that we're, we're, we're doing um, in, in the, the particular settings, uh, basinal settings that we see in, in the Burgess Shale, um, in the Sirius Pass in North Greenland, Chen, Chen Zhang, Chin Zhang, um, these sorts of faunas are, are going to capture the biodiversity of the time and that's our, uh, our key hypothesis. Um, certainly the work I've done um, in the Ordovician in the um, Scandinavian mountain belt, um, we identified early mid, middle Ordovician fossils from places like Otter, which were island complexes in which um, it was very hard to collect the material. It's in a mountain belt. The material's not very well preserved um, and the material wasn't very abundant, but it was very high diversity for the numbers of specimens we collected. So really as a target, you're absolutely right. We should be trying to find some of these um, areas where, where you know, we get similar environments today. Unfortunately, um, a lot of these areas, these microcontinents, volcanic arcs, those sorts of things, would be caught up in the world's mountain belts. And, and so it makes it um, a little bit more difficult to collect material. It's not well preserved. It is rare. It has been cooped, um, tectonized. And, and, and so that, that, you're absolutely right, there will be a bias there in, in, in in that sort of uh, area. Okay, that's great. Um, just one final question. There's been some great questions coming in and we just don't have time to ask any more, but one final one is for Ren Bin, is oh, why yeah. has China so many exceptionally preserved biotas? Oh yeah, very good question because uh, I'm thinking this question I'm asking myself all the time. And uh, for, uh, well, uh, as a paleontologist working tens of years here in South China, um, currently at least uh, far, four reasons I can give the, the uh, audience. So first, um, China, uh, just uh, one of the slides I show, China, constitutes at least 10 different terrains or paleoplates. So each paleoplate has their own geological history with different geological records. So that's the first uh, reason. Secondly, now we concentrate on South China. So South China, it had a very unique paleogeographical setting. Uh, just now, Fred mentioned the it was a 
typical Peri Gondwana terrain. Uh, it's, a, it's a big island during the Eurovision or during the Paleozoic time um, with pretty high rate of speciation. So um, it's gradually moving northward and keeping the platform slope basin, uh, this paleogeographical setting. So with um, very complete lithological rock sequence, together with um, quite abundant um, biotic um, fossils of different um, kinds preserved in the rocks. So that's the um, possible reason for South China is so unique. Uh, we, we have so many uh, different things and so many um, um, new forms originated in South China. Let's say Brachiopod, um, in Orvision time, we have tens of Brachiopod genera originated, first occurred in South China. The third reason why um, China has so many exceptional preserved bi biotas, the third reason, I think, it's a subjective reason. It's we have a strong support from the government, uh, it's, which guarantees the large scale, continuous, and intensive investigations in almost everywhere in China. And we also have the largest group of paleontologists working in China. So that's the third reason. So the lastly, um, continuous effort on the public outreach help us uh, to form a situation that more and more people in China, they, not only those professional ones, but also many amateurs. So they know that they get to know the fossils. They are become interested in fossils and eventually they like the fossils and even they start to study the fossils. So that's uh, one of the reason. We, we, we just looking for fossils everywhere in China. <laughs> that's the, uh, one of the possible reasons. So uh, put together four reasons. That's the currently I can give you the explanation. Thank you. So may I introduce the Deputy Director General uh, Dr. Wang Zhengyu of CIS to give us a concluding remarks. Thank you, Professor Zhang, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Harper. And uh, it's really a pity that's only catch the last part of your presentation. Uh, but anyhow, it's, uh, I was able to visit your institute in Nanjing last month and uh, have a chance to see all your fascinating uh, collections of the fossils. So it's uh, definitely a place worthwhile a visit. Uh, I think this, uh, I also take this opportunity to thank the uh, two speakers and also the leaders of the two organizations, the vice chancellor, the pro vice chancellor, and also the vice uh, 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 president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And thanks for their vision and encouragement to make the uh, online uh, event and a possible. And of course, and my gratitude should also be given to the staffs and who actually the, uh, their efforts made the preparation uh, excellent, a, a chance for the audience and to experience uh, a, a wonderful exchange of ideas. And of course, I, 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 I see that uh, we are now in a very special period of time and the pandemic stopped the flow of a flight the flow of the people actually, but uh, it cannot stop the flow of knowledge. It cannot stop the flow of the scientific exchange and information. And more importantly, I think it is, uh, uh, it, it cannot stop the trust, the joint efforts, the sharing and the benefits from each other. So, uh, I think it's uh, 2,000 years ago, there was an ancient Chinese philosopher 
Lao Tzu, the founder of the Taoism, says, a misfortune is where a blessing grows. So for that, I see is uh, we have a confidence and we do expect a much more better future in the coming new year, the year 2021. So not only the knowledge can come across the border, but also our scientists can also come across the border to meet face to face and have a better chance to exchange your wonderful ideas for the fundings, discoveries, and promote the advancement of the science for the whole wide benefit of the people. So uh, I think this is a, uh, I wish everyone enjoy your about the presentations and also the questions. And I do wish, and we can continue, and in the future, to such activities online or offline. And also we're expecting a even more bright future in the coming years. So I'll stop here. I'll thank you again. And the, uh, 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 thank you, yes. Okay, um, thank you very, very much, um, Deputy Director Wang, for these very fine words, uh, very much appreciated by everybody. I'm going to give the last word now uh, to Durham University's uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Global, uh, Professor Claire O'Malley. Claire. Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you, Professor Wang, for your excellent words, with which I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I'm Professor Clara O'Malley, Pro Vice Chancellor Global at Durham. And on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank Renbin and Dave for a fascinating webinar. I have learned a great deal personally. I'm sure many others have. I'm sure you'll all agree that it was a really great way to kick off our Knowledge Across Borders series. As uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Corbridge said at the beginning of this webinar, Durham has a long-standing relationship and partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I've just been looking at SciVal at all the jointly co-authored papers that we have between uh, the, the two organizations. And it's, it's fantastic to see such high, quality, um, such high quality science. This collaboration can only be strengthened by such wonderful talks as the ones we've had today and by this Knowledge Across Borders webinar series. I'm delighted that more than 220 people joined us today. We had uh, 442 registrations overall from 28 countries right across the globe. I think every continent was represented. If you all have enjoyed today's webinar as much as we have, then I'm really pleased to say that further talks are planned in the Knowledge Across Borders series, and we will let you know the details of those in due course. We'd be delighted if you could join us again, but for now, I'd like to thank everybody who's made this possible, our two speakers, and I'd like to bring this webinar to a close. Thank you again for attending. We hope to see you next time.